Hello, I'm Dave Mowitz and welcome to Successful Farming. On today's program, I'm tracking the sale of two pieces of John Deere Precision Ag Equipment at auction. Then we feature a great farmer invention designed to convert a straight truck into a seed tender. The engine answer man, Ray Bohax, offers an invaluable repair and maintenance tip. And after these brief messages, I learn how to properly weigh a tractor so it operates at peak efficiency while minimizing compaction. So please stay tuned. Today on Top Shops, I'm at the Firestone Farm Tire Test Center in Columbiana, Ohio, talking with Tom Rogers of Firestone about uh, getting the most tractive efficiency and performance out of your tractor. And tires have a big impact on that, Tom, don't they? That's correct. Tires have a huge impact in how the tractor performs from an efficiency and a traction standpoint especially. Now we're gonna talk more about uh, tire inflation and get into that type of aspect at a later Top Shops uh, segment. Today, let's kind of focus on weighting because there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to weighting as opposed to the type of tractor you're operating, the type of work you're doing, whether it's on the road picking up bales, whether you're planting or whether you're tilling. So when a farmer sizes up his tractor, we're gonna get into planting here fairly soon where he's both tilling and planting. Um, how does he go about determining how much weight he needs and how to distribute it? What's the first step? So uh, one of the key things first is understanding your horsepower. Horsepower of the machine you're operating and kind of the configuration of that. Uh, I think horsepower is easily determined and we stand here in front of an 8530. The example is it's a 275 PTO horsepower machine. And you like PTO horsepower best? We use PTO horsepower for all of our, our formulas and calculations when we're determining what the weight should be and how we set up the tractor. Because between the engine and the PTO, there's a bit of parasitic loss to Correct. conditioning, hydraulic system. The cooling things. system, yeah, the high, yeah, there's only so much horsepower that actually makes it to the ground. What we want to do is that horsepower that's left, we want to most efficiently use it. So now you have the PTO horsepower of your tractor, you ready to go? There's a few other steps. There's a few steps and there's a lot of kind of calculations and formulas and some scenarios that we'll run through based on the machine type, the machine size, and eventually even implements and other loads that you put on the machine. So I know there's differences between where you place the weight. because You've determined how much weight you're going to put on that right. tractor but it's just not the same. That's determined by the configuration of the tractor, right, Tom? Um, a two-wheel drive tractor is gonna run 25% of the weight on the front axle, 75% on the rear, and the only powered axle. On a mechanical front-wheel drive tractor, you've kinda got two scenarios. For hitch-mounted equipment uh, that's heavy load on the hitch, you're gonna have a little more load in the rear at 65% rear, 35% front. If it's a drawbar pull type of application, it's more of a 40-60 splint. And then uh, articulated four-wheel drives come in a little different because of that machine and it's, you know, how it's built. It's 55% of the weight on the front axle, 45% on the rear. Are there extenuating circumstances when it comes to that weight split, say if you're running a, a front-wheel drive tractor with a loader carrying bales, do you ever adjust it for something like that? Or you're pulling a box scraper behind doing land work? An implement can change the weight distribution on the machine. Uh, and a loader, the loader itself weighs something and adds weight to the front axle. Okay. But when you add the bale, you're adding more weight. And, and in the end, we have to compensate for that heaviest condition as well. So Tom, how do we start the process? Can you just assume every tractor is the same? So right, so, and, and the thing is, and that's what becomes a challenge uh, uh, for farmers to, to kind of get into their setup, is every tractor is different. Uh, it, whether it's how it's set up, what the implements are, what they're doing, the configurations, the weight packages they have on it. So in the, in the, at the beginning, and we start running these calculations, we know our horsepower, we know the type of machine it is, so we know what our splits want to be. Now we need to weigh it and see where we're at and then see maybe what we need to adjust. We have a uh, John Deere 8530 here. 
Walk us through the process of figuring out and calculating ballast and ballast distribution. Right, so what we want to do with this tractor is try to first determine where we should be. And I've run some numbers on it, and we know from John Deere that this 8530 has 275 PTO horsepower. That times our 130 pounds per horsepower yields us a total machine weight of 35,750 pounds. So now we know kind of where we want to be in total machine weight. We want to set it up on a 40-60 split front to rear uh, because we'll use it in a drawbar type application. That 40-60 split gets us in an ideal condition 14,300 on the front axle and 21,450 on the rear axle. So Tom, we've figured out the weight we need and where to place it, uh, but how does a person determine uh, what his tractor actually weighs if he doesn't have scales at the farm? So in probably one of the easiest things is uh, we all take grain to the grain elevator. We can take a tractor down, they have certified scales, we can weigh on an axle, per axle basis there and typically get what we need to understand what our weight is. Back in the good old days, most anybody could understand what the hieroglyphic writing on the side of a tire meant, but that's changed. Not only has that changed to a metric measure, but also tire configurations have changed in, in the way that they're built, because I hear things like VF and IF these days. You need to know that when you get into this aspect of, of weighting and ballasting, don't you? Right, so there's a lot more in the sizing of the, of the tire and what it means uh, than what we used to have with, with some of our more traditional sizes. Um, if you want to talk about sizing itself, the first number in the size is the section width, so the width of the tire uh, in millimeters. Then there's a slash and you get an aspect ratio. So the aspect ratio is 80 in this example on a 480-80R50 is the height of the sidewall proportionate to that section width. So the section width is 80%, the height is 80% as tall as that width. Then the last part becomes a little easier. R is radial and 50 is your 50 inch rim diameter. So Tom, in recent years, we've seen new nomenclature uh, come into being and that's IF and VF. You have to walk me through this. What's the difference? Yeah, so that is, that's new technology, you're right, in the last few years. And uh, what IF and VF is are, are industry standards approved and adopted by, by the Tire and Rim Association. And IF is uh, for a given tire size, an IF, these are radials, the IF can carry 20% more load at the same inflation pressure as a standard tire. Oh. VF is one step further, it can carry 40% more load than the same size standard oh. tire. Okay. So it's great in terms of load capacity. The other benefit comes in on tractors where we're really looking for lower pressures, we can carry less load, or say the same load at lower pressures. What's the you got to kind of remind me here because the advantage of running at lower pressures is... Right, so as we talk about, yeah, all this ballasting and we're carrying this weight right. across the field of the tractor, if we can carry that weight at a lower pressure, we're doing a couple of things. We're improving traction. We put down a bigger footprint, a longer footprint. Oh. The footprint elongates, uh, so that improves traction, better traction, better efficiency, it eventually yields better fuel consumption. Then, as well, that footprint is less compaction. So a lower PSI translates into a lower ground pressure. When a farmer goes in to order a tractor or he's uh, putting new tires on his tractor that the old ones are worn, it's, it's not he's being sold a bill of goods when, when the dealer says you really ought to consider VF. There is a reason why they're gonna pay more for that tire because the tire construction the sidewall, for example, allows that lower pressure, doesn't it? In essence, and, and our AD2 product, which is our IF and VF uh, tires and sizes, are designed, in essence, to run at uh, underinflated type condition. We've designed into the structure and the, the body of the tire to run greater deflected or at a greater squat and carry it appropriately and survive. So. We got our weight down properly, how much we need to add or how much to subtract, because that might be the case with some tractors. Um, we also have figured out uh, what tires that we're running and inflation pressures with that. What's the next step in actually ballasting the tractor? Uh, so we go to our, our data book. I would go to my Firestone data book, look up this front tire, 670R30, look at what the pressure is, and then calculating it for the, for the given load, that's the proper inflation pressure. Well, thanks, Tom, for hosting us here in this great site. I'll see you again on another Top Shop tour.
Hi, and welcome to the Engine Man segment of the Successful Farming TV Show. I'm Ray Bohax, and I'm over here in Columbiana, Ohio, at the Firestone Ag Tires Test Facility. It's a real neat place where they do all the testing and research development on their farm tire line, and it's at Harvey Firestone's actual family farm. But I'm not here today to talk about tires. I'm here to talk about gasoline engine performance and problems that you could have with the ignition system on a gas engine. Oftentimes, we'll have a gas engine that runs fine under one condition. It may idle fine, but it may not work well under load, and that's often a very hard problem to diagnose. Many times we think it's fuel, but it's actually ignition. The spark plug on every gasoline engine fires from the center electrode to the side electrode if it has some sort of inductive coil. On some modern engines with distributorless ignition, one cylinder fires positive and one side fires negative, it fires the other way. But on the engines that you would have on the farm, this is the firing pattern. The ignition coil is considered a bank account. It has to be charged to be able to fire the spark plug. The more energy that you put in the coil, the more energy that you come out. The thing that's important to realize is that, like blood pressure in a human being, is that the demand on the coil varies with the load on the engine. At idle and light load, there's very little demand on the coil. As you start to load that engine, let's say if it's on a, on a seed tender and you're starting to move some seed and you put it under load, the ignition demand goes up dramatically. And that is when a weak coil can come and show itself. To check a coil properly, you need a tool called an oscilloscope. I realize that most farmers don't have that, so we could check it with an ohmmeter. It's very simple. What you would do is take your ohmmeter, and you'd go across the positive and negative terminals, and you would take a reading from here. This coil has about 2.4 ohms, and then you would go from the positive terminal to the center terminal, and you need to bring your meter up to a higher scale. And this coil has about 90, 8,800 ohms from primary to secondary. If the coil is shorted, you will have very little resistance, and if it's starting to burn open, right, you will have high resistance. When you have high resistance, that engine has the potential to idle perfectly, but as soon as you put a load on it, it'll start to buck, misfire, spit, and possibly even stall. It's that easy to check your ignition coil. If I can ever help you in any way, please feel free to contact me, not only about ignition coils, but any piece of equipment in your farm shop or on your farm operation. You could contact me at sfengineman@agriculture.com. Thanks so much for watching. You have a blessed day, and I hope to see you again in the farm shop. An increasing amount of used precision ag equipment is available at dealer stores or being sold at auction, and that offers you the opportunity to add such technology to equipment at affordable prices. Join me at auction to see what a John Deere monitor and receiver sells for. So please stay tuned. Today on Steel Deals, I'm going to do something entirely different. You see, normally I talk about iron, tractors, combines, implements, trucks, and so on. But I'm seeing far more interest in precision ag equipment like this showing up either at dealerships or at auctions, like the sale being conducted by Steffes Auctioneers. What we have here for sale today is a John Deere ITC Starfire receiver and a 2600 display. Now in the past, used precision ag equipment sat on shelves collecting dust, or it would go with the machinery that is being sold. Today, there's a growing marketplace for such equipment as both farmers and dealers are realizing that they have worth. A good example of this can be found on Deere's online dealer site, machinefinder.com. Searching that site, I uncovered 25 listings for Starfire receivers and no less than 81 2600 displays. I went online and was stunned. The simple search turned out even far more precision ag equipment beyond deer. And that is just the tip of the iceberg regarding the availability of used precision ag equipment that I recently discovered when talking to John Bickle of Used Precision Ag Solutions. I'm talking with John Bickle of Used Precision Ag Solutions. And John, I'm looking at this piece of uh, precision ag equipment at this auction I'm attending. What should I look for if I'm buying a piece of equipment like that? One thing I also look at is try to look at the serial number of the device 
and uh, see what year it was made. Sometimes the serial number tells you the year it was made, sometimes it doesn't. But uh, on some of these touchscreen devices, these touchscreens only last, you know, five, six years and they do wear out. Do you have any buying tips when buying used equipment? And you want to know what the new price is too. I mean, having an idea what they'd sell for new and find out what you can purchase it used for. Uh, I've been to some auctions where <laughs> things have gone higher than new. Um, so it, it, it pays to do your research ahead of time knowing what the costs are. How can you do that research? A lot of times you can go online, you can give me a call, there's people you can call your local dealers. They'll give you some ideas of what prices or what things are worth uh, on the market right at that point. You would mentioned like on screens being one of the pitfalls. Are there other pitfalls to buying used equipment uh, either from a dealer or at auction? Having all the cabling. I mean, um, you'd be surprised how many people call me and they said they bought a monitor but they're missing this cable or missing that cable. So knowing that all the cabling is there, all the cards are there, the, the, the mounts are there, uh, if it comes with a manual, but usually you can download the manual free of charge online from all these places. What about warranty? Now you might buy a tractor, has some gear in it, it's no more than a year old or so. Does that mean the warranty necessarily always crosses over to the next buyer? Typically a warranty on a monitor is one to two years. Um, so they will transfer over. I mean, uh, they're not tied to an individual person most of the time. So they will transfer over. Um, but odds are you're probably going to buy something without a warranty on it. Now, if someone needs to contact you, how would they do that? If they go to our website, usepercisionag.com. Thank you for the information, John. Let's get back to the auction. I got three on the net, now four. I'm bigger than four now. Four than five now. I got four over than five, five, five than five. Everybody needed a break. And now did you want to bid and five on another pair? I got four over than five, five, five than five. Then and I want to bid you better bid and five on another day. I got four hundred and then five, five, five than five, five than five, five than five, five. Just for guidance right here, five hundred and times up. Gonna sell it in the crowd. I'm five now six. Six right here, what do you say? Hey, look at there, six and seven, seven, seven. Hey, did anybody know minus seven hundred out of where? Hey, look at there, now seven hundred out of more. Bid you better bid seven hundred on the morning. Bid you better bid seven hundred on the now. Did you want to bid seven hundred on the day or now? Have them times up. Sold it six hundred dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, line number 130, we got this AMS equipment right here. It's a John Deere 2600 display. I got 20, 100, 22. I got 20, 100, 22. Want to bid, 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 22, 22. Anybody in now, 23. I got 23, 24. I got 23, 24. Internet got to bid, 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 2400 out of where? I got 23, 24. Want to bid, 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 24, 24, 24. Tim says there's activations. 24, 25. I got 25, with the 26. I got 25, with the 26 right here. Want to bid, 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 2600 out of where? I got 25, with the 26. I get that much for round box and SF1 cards. 26, 26, 26, 26, 26, 27, 26 and 7, 7, 7. Hey, you've been about 27 right here, now having 27, 28. I get 27 right here, been 28. Spend enough time, 28 under down there, now 9. And 9, 9, bit the 9, bit the 9, bit the 9, 3. I'm 29 under down there, now I'm 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, so how does the $600 and the $3,000 final bids on the receiver and the display compare to dealer asking prices? Remember, I had mentioned that I had tracked down 81 displays for sale with prices ranging from $2,200 up to $2,900, but the vast majority of them were priced to sell at $2,750. And what about those receivers? The entire lot of 25 ITC receivers listed at MachineFinder.com were marked at $900. Certainly, the marketplace has found consistent prices for equipment, but knowing a reasonable bid isn't enough when buying used electronics. Like John Bickle said in the interview, you really need to know what is current on the market. Has the item you're interested in been well taken care of? Does it have all the accessories like cables to make it run? Has it been tested? Does it even run? Those are all good questions to ask before buying. Get answers from people like John or your local equipment dealer. Now, for more information about used precision ag solutions, go to their website at usedprecisionag.com. I'll see you again next week on another Steel Deals Report. After these brief messages, we feature a great grain truck seed tender. Hello, my name is Gary Nottemaker. 
I live in north central Kansas in Smith County. I'm a third generation farmer and uh, lived here all my life. And what we're looking at today is an idea I come up with the first time I used this truck and grain trailer. I was horribly disappointed the way the grain dumped all over the hitch on this trailer. So I come up with this idea. And it, the guys at the elevator all asked me where I got it. They wish they, the other trucks had it like that. And every one of them compliments me and I tell them, well, I, I had it in successful farming. And they think, well, that's pretty neat. The, really the only investment in it, this idea was my time involved to build it. Made out of just a bunch of scrap tin and iron and, and it's fastened on there with, with light bolts and a tarp strap. This, this works pretty good. I'd, I'd be pretty satisfied with making another one just like it. And this truck, the original grain gate, the geometry in it and everything, it just, just didn't work good. It, and the older it got, the worse it got. I finally told my brother at harvest time that when he come back next year, it was going to be different. And, and once again, I had to scratch my head quite a while to figure out how to do it. But it has worked really well ever since. It was a one-armed lever affair that opened and closed the gate. And the way they had it designed, it pulled way out too much and it, it didn't open worth a hoot. After looking at the, the grain gates and hopper bottoms, I could, could see that that would be possible to make a version of it for the back of the truck. I, I bought some new, new components, the sprockets and the chain, but I had an idea about how to make it work. And it was one of those rainy day projects that took more than one day. It took a lot of, a lot of time to piddle around and make things fit right. One, one of the tricks was to open the, this whole center cargo door, as they call it. There had to be a way to couple and uncouple this, this shaft that controls that grain gate. And, and I figured out a way to do that. So the total cost of that project was a couple of rainy days in the shop time and maybe $50 invested in material. For more information about this idea and other farmer inventions, go to agriculture.com slash TV. Be sure to join us next week for our Christmas gift guide special program, our merry band of shopping elves at Successful Farming, and yes, I'm one of those elves, offer a Christmas tree full of gift recommendations ranging from technology gadgets to the latest in shop tools. In the meantime, be sure to visit the show's website at agriculture.com slash TV to get more information on this show and to view past episodes. And as always, let us know what you think of the show. Look for the show's email address at agriculture.com slash TV. See you next week right here on Successful Farming. Hi, I'm Dave Mowitz. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, hit subscribe right here if you haven't already, and click that little bell right here to be notified when we post a new video. And click here to see more great episodes from Successful Farming Television.